It is with great joy that we begin this second chapter of the confession, a chapter that I find to be absolutely exciting, one that I really, really enjoy reading. My hope and my prayer is that you enjoy walking through this as well. We are going to begin to walk through the first paragraph of the second chapter of the confession. We will be covering this red portion here from the confession in the first paragraph of the second chapter. Let me go ahead and read that. And it says, The Lord our God is but one, only living and true God, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself. And there is so much that could be said just off of this portion of a sentence, because it's a very long sentence. Uh, but just even out of this portion, numerous sermons could be written over different areas that are being brought out. But there's three pieces that I want us to focus upon individually. And the first is, the singularity of God, the second is the aseity of God, and the third is the incomprehensibility of God. And the singularity of God is that God is one God. There is but one God. There is no other who is God except for the one who is God, and that is God. There are no port, part gods. God is God. The Aseity of God. It's the second portion that we begin to walk through. And this is the understanding that God is one who is complete in and of himself. He is not lacking in any way. He is not one who is in need of anyone to do anything for him in any way. He's complete in and of himself. Thirdly, the incomprehensibility of God. This declaration that God is one of whom that only God knows all that there is to know about God. God is the one who is the chief expert on God. And in all that he has declared to us, the vastness of it that we have seen in that which has been made, the vastness of it in the declared word of God and special revelation is but a portion of what there is to know about God. You, know, you will spend all of eternity, please know this, you will spend all of eternity growing in your knowledge of who God is. You think you have arrived in knowing who God is, you are mistaken. You are short-sighted in your understanding of who God is, or you are perhaps not worshiping the true God, worshiping rather a God of your imagination, a God crafted in your own image. Let's walk through these three very important uh, pieces that are brought out here at the beginning of the second chapter. The singularity of God. The Lord our God is but one only living and true God. There is but one God. And that is it. This is where the Bible begins. The Bible begins here. The Bible doesn't begin with an apologetic on the... The Bible begins in the beginning, God. Before all else came into being, there was God. And everything else came from God. God was the beginning. It's important to see this. This is really where the writers in Scripture stand. The writers in Scripture stand with a declaration of the reality of the one true God. Many times repeated in the Scriptures. In Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Oh, this Lord that is spoken of here. 
This Lord that Moses declares is unlike the gods of the pagan nations around them. Unlike those nations, this is but one God. He shares his glory with no other. He is not bound geographically. He is not bound by the whims of men. See the ways that even Paul uses this. So many times he uses the character and nature of God, the attributes of God to call people to act in certain ways. One thing I want you to see as we're walking through this, I want you to see the ways in which this is immensely practical. This is immensely profitable for you in your Christian life. Look at what Paul says here. 1 Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 4. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol is, has no real existence. And there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. Look at the practical application that Paul uses here. There is but one God. What sense does it make to be offering food to idols? They are no real gods. You're rather worshiping that which the real God made rather than worshiping the one who made that which you're worshiping. Jeremiah 10.10 But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the everlasting King. At his wrath the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. So crucial we begin here in the confession. So crucial we begin here as Christians. With a recognition of that which is evident. With a recognition of that which we know to be true. That there is but one God. And he has brought all things into existence. And all things exist for his glory. Louis Burkhoff in his systematic theology book makes this statement. He says, we start the study of theology with two presuppositions. Namely, number one, that God exists. And number two, that he has revealed himself in his divine word. And for that reason, it is not impossible for us to start with a study of God. We can turn to his revelation in order to learn what he has revealed to us concerning himself and concerning his relation to his creatures. See, Burkhoff there starts where the theologians of old began. Burkhoff there starts where the prophets of old began Burkhoff starts where the apostles began, that God exists. That's where Moses began in the book of Genesis, as we saw. He's what we know as a presuppositionalist. All people are ultimately presuppositionalists, but it's one that rightly recognizes these things that they are believing. That I know this to be true. Without a recognition of God's existence, nothing else is going to make sense. We can walk through all those other reasons and other study, but apart from the creative work of God, apart from the real God, nothing makes any sense. Nothing is going to have any meaning, and that is the result. That is the path that one is down if you begin on a path of denying God. You will have a life that, has, that lacks any real meaning because you are separating yourself. You're distancing yourself from whom all meaning comes. God is the one for whom all things exist. As we've been studying, as we've seen in the first chapter of Colossians, as Paul has so 
greatly displayed in 16 and 17. Speaking of Christ, he says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. God is but one. And God has made all that there is. We, we don't look at the things around us. We don't see what God has made and gradually work ourselves backwards if possible. Well, let me just see. Let me be unbiased and really rationally look at all that is around me. Well, but you're assuming there's a consistency between what you see and what is around you. You're assuming that there is some kind of an actual order in this world. You're assuming that there's some kind of meaning and purpose in attaining knowledge and gaining intelligence. On what basis do you make these assumptions? If there's no God, you have no basis for any of this. No reason for all of this. See, God gives meaning to life. God gives meaning to existence. He gives purpose and significance to existence. You must understand this. You must understand this when you are talking with someone else, when you are speaking with someone who tries to tell you, I don't believe that there's evidence for God. You do not approach this conversation as though that unbeliever is sitting there as judge and jury over the existence of God. That man is breathing the air of God. That man is eating the food that God has given him. That is a lie. The person is not being honest. And then you go and bring it forward like you're some kind of a great attorney. You're Perry Mason bringing forward this evidence that deserves a, fer a verdict. So-called evidence that deserves a verdict. When teacher Arden Hodges makes this point, I appreciate it. He says, the Bible begins where the atheist ends. The Bible begins where the atheist ends. The, the atheist says, I've examined all the evidence. Or perhaps, since that's logically inconsistent, since that can be demonstrated to be false very quickly in a debate, he will say, well, I have examined all of the evidence that I have seen so far. And based on the evidence that I have seen so far, I do not see any evidence that God exists. And that's where he ends. He says, I am a perfectly wise person. I am an unbiased person. I'm examining the evidence in an unbiased way. Is that not how all of our news stations like to purport themselves fair and balanced, unbiased? What does God say about the one who claims God not exist, does not exist? It says in Psalm 14, 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And he continues, they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. And you should recognize those words because that is the psalm from which Paul got a lot of what he writes in Romans chapter 3. There is a degree to which at any point when you begin to deny the true God, you are practicing a form of atheism. That's somewhat of what the author is getting at here. We all end up worshiping something. The Bible doesn't begin with, well, this person is unbiased in their thinking and you're merely just trying to categorize the world and merely just trying to make sense of what is around them and come to sound conclusions. No. The Bible speaks truth to that person in love. The Bible begins with the one from whom all truth comes. 
the true and living God. God is the center of all truth. Oh, carnal man, academic atheistic man, says man is the center of all truth, and you have your truth here, and you have your truth here, and we have this gumbo of philosophies and religions that get all mixed up. It's not the real world. See, the real world is not one where there is no God. The real world is the one where God is in existence. The ways, the mockery that is given. I should have put the picture up here. I put it up many years back when we walked through apologetics. The mockery that is given. Someone that thought they were so sophisticated and so intelligent came up with this idea of the, the flying spaghetti monster. And said, oh, okay, you have your God in the sky and this little fairy that does these magical things for you. I worship the flying spaghetti monster. And they call themselves pastafarians and try to mock other religions that have certain garbs. And so you have these silly people going into the DPS office to take their driver's license picture. And they put upon their head um, colanders because that's what they wear in their religion of pastafarianism. It's the uh, mockery is so deep. It's not where the Bible begins. That is the imaginary world. The imaginary world is one where there is no God. The real world is one in which there is a God. And you are being blessed by him. And you are using what he has given you. You are using the brain that he's given you. You're using the eyes and the ears, the intellect. Day after day, not giving glory to him. There's another way that we often will go and try to deal with someone who does not recognize the existence of God is denying the existence of God. And these are some that I've talked about at great detail in a Sunday school lesson we walked through called Proofs of God's Existence, or rather, I think it was called Apologetics as Proof, Part 2. And we walk through these different aspects, and they have their own use. They have their time and their place. I believe that I am presuppositional, but I do find uses and purposes for these at certain times, but not as one who has the unbeliever sitting upon the bench as though they are ruling and judging over God. We have these different proofs, the moral argument for God, the existence of moral laws points to one who is the lawgiver. It's incredible how some will say, how can there be a God when there is so much evil in the world? You might say, well, what do you mean by evil if there is no God? How do you make this determination as to what is right and what is wrong? What is the ultimate standard of what is good and what is bad? One of the ways there has been times and countries where entire cultures have gone directions that we have for now. That we despise, that we say, how could so many people have done such evil? But for them, it was good. They felt it was good. In their mind, their morality that they had, what is the ultimate standard? See, the fact that we have such consistency in morality in this world points to one from whom the moral law comes. You might go to the cosmological argument, the, the fact that the universe had to have a cause. The universe is in a state of change. Something that is changing cannot the eternal cannot have always existed. That's a philosophical road that I'm not going to go down, but I'm going to lay it out there and state it. And so clearly, there must have been one who moved. There must have been, as Aristotle says, an unmoved mover. The teleological argument, seeing the design in the world, seeing how things work so well. I barely have to give any thought at all. I'm moving my hands. I'm speaking. You're understanding the things that I'm saying. I'm breathing air. The, we can go through all these different details. Can we not? The 
axis of the earth, the distance from the sun, and you've been through science class, you know many of these different details that are there, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle, all these different cycles that exist, some of which we probably don't even know about at this time. It gives evidence that someone created things this way because we see the reality of entropy in the world, that things are degrading, so they didn't just come into being this way. It's very reasonable, the epistemological argument for God. How do we know what it is that we know? There's entire sciences that, are, that study that. How is it that we know what we know? Why is it that what is around me, or rather, why is it that what I see around me corresponds to what is actually happening? Someone had to make it that way. Someone had to make things around me to be this way, and I had to be made in such a way that I can comprehend and understand these things in a way that makes sense. That's not a small thing. Any of you have ever worked with just even getting two computers to get along or, or two different devices? All of these people in the world that exist, and that which is around them corresponds to that which they're understanding. Now there are times where that's not true. But that points even a greater light upon all the times when it actually is. The ontological argument, the existence of God, is necessary because the absence would be absurd. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that one. That one takes a long time to explain. Um, last one, the transcendental argument. Without the existence of God, without the existence of him, nothing ultimately is going to make sense. If all is merely natural, if matter is all that matters, how do we account for knowledge? How do we account for mathematics? How do we account for laws of logic? Why is it that I can go out and grab a flower from outside and within that flower is sufficient information in the DNA of that flower to create another flower from dirt and sunlight and water. Where did that information come from? It had to come from another source. It doesn't just spring into existence and then everything just flows together. Without God, nothing else makes any sense. It's probably the best argument out of all of them. And all of these are helpful in their own right. They all serve a purpose, I believe, but none of them are actually necessary. This is what I want you to see. This is where I believe the confession is on this, and this is where we have argued in the past, even as we talked about apologetics, that believing is seeing. Someone will say, you know what, I'll believe it when I see it. It's not what Jesus would say. It's not what the prophets said in the days of old. Okay? They, they weren't waiting for someone to come up with some new apologetic method so that they could really cause people to understand and believe. You don't see it because you're not believing. What you're believing is affecting how you're interpreting and processing the information that you have. Two different people with two different worldviews can look at the same information and come up with different conclusions because they use that information differently. Didn't Jesus say if someone even rose from the dead, they wouldn't believe? It's so ironic that he says that. He did raise from the dead. And people wrote it off. They came up with other conclusions. Well, maybe the disciples stole his body or maybe he didn't really die. A man will come up with all kinds of excuses. See, this is where Paul was in Romans 3. Man's natural disposition is not seeking after God. Man's natural disposition is in rebellion to God. As he says there, beginning in verse 10, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. That is our problem. Our problem is we don't want God. We desire God not. Augustine says this, faith is to believe what you do not see. 
the reward of this faith is to see what you believe. What a fantastic quote. How should we be declaring the truth of God? I'm applying this. How should we be declaring the truth of God? I want to look to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. See how Paul does this. He says, beginning in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Look at how his goal here is not to figure out how to trick people into understanding. Not to dim the lights. And not to bring counselors forward so that he can try to seal the deal today and get someone to choose Jesus. He's not using deceptive practices. He's not telling people, well, God has voted and Satan has voted and now you must cast the deciding vote. Oh, the foolishness that we walk into when we don't remember who God is and who man is. We take away even that which is most beneficial, which is the truth of who God is and what God has done on our behalf and what we can gain if we would but trust in him and but believe upon him. That's not in need of our tricks. God's not in need of our cunning. He's not sitting up there just waiting for us to come up with the, the, the next best idea so that he can save the world. Waiting for us just to come up with the best strategy so that he can really grow his church. Continuing, he says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Look what he points out there. The reason why people have the problem that they do is that they are blinded. They're blinded by the God of this world. They're blinded by themselves. They're seeking after what they desire. So they desire not God. He continues, for what we proclaim is not ourselves. How we need to take that to heart. It should not be about proclaiming ourselves. He continues, but Jesus Christ is Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Where is Paul's rest? Where is Paul's hope? His hope is not in cunning ways, in crafty ways. Certainly there may be different ways that you have conversations with people. You're, the, the gospel is not sitting there just telling people that they're liars and God-haters over and over and over. You speak to people in kindness. You speak to people in different ways. And the conversation may go through different pathways. And you may even talk about some of these rational arguments for the existence of God. But with the understanding that I'm merely having this conversation with the goal of pointing this person back to the gospel. Pointing this person to who God is. What they already know to be true. Reminding them, you know this to be true. This is why you know it's true. You know this to be true, and this is the evidence of it. <laughs> How many times do we see Jesus using that argumentation? Like, or do you not know? So many times Jesus says this. Jesus points people to truth that they already know to be true, that they are denying in the inconsistency of their thoughts, denying in the inconsistency of their actions. See, Paul here is pointing them to the true God. And pointing them to what God has done through Jesus Christ. The one and true God. The singularity of God. That God is but one. Secondly, the aseity of God. It says here, whose subsistence is in and of himself. God's independence. God is independent 
of all things. There are two categories of existence, okay? There is the one who created, and then there's everything else that was created. God was not created. God has always existed. God is not in need of anything. Let's look at a couple of passages where we see this idea. <clears throat> Jeremiah 10, 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Isaiah 48 and verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel whom I called. I am he, I am the first, I am the last. See, God is the reason for God. Nobody makes God. No one sustains God. No one builds God up. God is, as we have said, he is the uncaused cause. Even pagans in the past have recognized this. There must have been one who brought all into existence that is separate from everything that is in existence. God is not in need of us in any way. He is in need of no one else. God is complete in every way in himself. If he were not, he would not be God. I want you to see this. this the doctrine of the aseity of God has great practical application in your life. I want you to see this because almost all idolatry that I can think of makes this error. It makes God out to be someone who is, is just like God. Where people are approaching God as though he, he needed them. Is that not what the writer in Psalm 50 says? As the Lord says, the Lord says, if I was hungry, I would not call you. Why does he say that? He says that because that is how they were approaching him. They were approaching him as though he, ne he needed something from them. As though they are doing him a favor. But that's not who he is. The Israelites were acting as though God needed them, but their sacrifices were supposed to be pointing to their need of God. They were supposed to be pointing to their sin. Every time they brought that animal forward, and that animal was killed, and that animal was torn apart, and that animal was thrown into the fire and burned that was a reminder of their sin. That was a reminder of what they absolutely deserved. And God was showing them kindness. God was showing them mercy. God was sending one. God was sending one that would deal with their greatest problem, which was their sin. Oh, it's not man condescending to God. Oh, I'm really doing God a favor and coming to church today. Shame on you. Shame on you. You are the one who is in need of God. You are the one who is in need of blessing. You are the one who is in need of being reminded of who God is and who you really are. Oh, it is God who has condescended to man. Because God has no need of man. God never needed man. Man could have never exi existed and God would have been complete in and of himself. The Lord could have wiped man out as soon as he sinned. God would have been complete in and of himself. He wouldn't have been lacking in any way. He's in need of nothing. And here's where you need to see this applying. Because this, th this affects us in how we approach God. How many times do we see in so many modern worship songs... Even some terrible hymns of the past. There's many terrible hymns of the past. You just must remember that, that for the most part we have together the great ones. Those are the ones we keep singing. But there's many terrible, terrible hymns. You have modern songs that sing things like, like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all. Is that what happened upon the cross? Is that the glory of God that was displayed? Him raising you up to be the center of all that he is doing. You being that which is of most significance. You being the one to whom glory is displayed. 
See, when we miss this doctrine, we approach God like he's a man. We approach God like he's one of our children, like he's our spouse, like he's our buddy. Reverence is in due order, I believe, in many ways. In many ways, we lack reverence in our approaching to God. And I don't mean merely in stuffy ways or high liturgical ways. Because even in some of that, we are approaching God as but a man. He is not. He is high. He is lifted up. He is above all things. He is complete in every way. And here's what happens when you worship a God like that. You worship a God that's really of no real use, of no real significance. Don't you see this? If you worship a God who is in need of you, how will such a God save you? A God is merely pining after you because he's there's something missing inside of him. I know I've shared it before, but there was one of the worst Sunday school lessons I was ever told as a child. We have that great passage that began, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and this woman felt the need to go and fill me in on a bunch of stuff that the writer hadn't written there. So instead of beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, she gave us a, a, a prologue. Let us know on, in on something that the writers hadn't told us. You know, God was all alone. He was all by himself. For all eternity, he had been sitting there with no one else to talk to. We're all little kids sitting there, so it's like, oh, we can relate to that, right? In the playground with no friends, or I don't have anyone else to hang out with. That's not where the biblical authors begin. That's not an accurate description of who God is. God is not one who was in need of you and made you. And then, oh no, everything just fell apart. What am I going to do now? These people that I really needed and I really loved, they fell. And I made this beautiful garden for them. And now I've got to kick them out of it. And what am I going to do? No, that's not at all what has happened that's idolatry. That is, that is man making God in his image. Just doing what the psalmist said in Psalm 50, thinking God was just like us. God's not one that needs your help. We are the one who need God's help. We are the one. Who's incomplete? God's not incomplete without us. God is complete in and of himself. You don't need a God with baggage. You don't need a God who, who needs someone else. No, you are the one who needs a God who is complete. And that is the true God. You don't complete God. You don't fulfill God in his being. He already is all that he is ever going to be. He is sufficient in and of himself. He just is. What's he tell Moses? Go tell them, I am sent you. I am. I'm in existence. That, that, that is, that's what you need to know. I am the one who always has been. I am the one who always will be. You don't complete God. God completes you. And apart from God, you will never be what you were designed to be. You will never reach your full potential. You will never be all that you can possibly be. And I know that sometimes we shy away from these kinds of statements because we have prosperity gospel people that run off with these ideas. But being all that you can be is not about driving fancy cars. It's not about flying jets. It is about living in a way that glorifies God. It's about you rightly being an image bearer of God, rightly bearing the image of God, rightly walking in conformity to God's law. Oh, that is God's will for your life, dear friend. It is God's will that you would do that. And you cannot do that on your own. You are incomplete. You are damaged. 
You need God's assistance. He doesn't need yours. One of the ways that people's prayers at times sound as though God's just needing them. They're praying as though God didn't even know what was going on. And you're just telling them everything that's going on. No, God is perfect. And God is complete in and of himself. Praise God for that. Praise God that God is all that God is. That he is complete in and of himself. That he's not pining after us. That he never was fretting. Man fell. I'm sorry, God's always been in existence. There's a covenant of redemption that he is now bringing forward that he immediately begins to speak of. The child of the woman will crush the head of the servant. He didn't have to figure that out. God's always been. Satan tries to scheme. Satan tries to act in his crafty ways. But Satan is but a created being. And who are we that we would seek to be crafty and scheme? We've seen this in the the scriptures. Will someone, before they, they do some terrible act, and Moses is standing there over the Egyptian, what does he look to the left? He looks to the right. Who's he fooling? Who's he kidding? How many of us have done the same thing? Look over here, look over there. Well, maybe I'll, I'll delete my trail, I'll delete my paper trail. I'll remove the evidence. I'm sorry, there's one who is all-knowing. There's one who has always existed. You're not hiding anything from him. He knows all things. You will give an account to him. He is one who is not lacking in every, any way. He is complete, and we are the ones who are in need of him. Praise God that God is God. Praise God that God is all that it is to be God. Be praying that we would see this, that we would rightly recognize the ways we should be affected by this. I'm going to close there. We did not get to my third point, the incomprehensibility of God. But I'm very happy at how we're laying this out because I can just begin there next time. And it's not a big deal. So we already have the beginning portion of next time written out where we will begin here with this next line that says, Infinite in being and perfection whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself. Let's go ahead and pray